Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. If you've never been here before, welcome back. If you have, this is the celebration we're doing for me achieving 666 subscribers. It's a small milestone. It doesn't get you any money. It doesn't get you any advertising. It doesn't help you in any way, really. But when you play board games and you play Kingdom Death, the numerical factor, it, it's worth something. So uh, the subscribers had said, hey, let's do some Kingdom Death materials. And I thought, that's a great idea. Let's look around the room and see what I haven't built yet, see what I haven't done yet, and what would be the most useful thing for the most number of people out there. And I settled on the Giga Lion. So we're going to assemble, paint, and then in another episode, play against the Giga Lion. I've got all my tools here, so let's talk about what is the Giga Lion first. Well, it is a vignette, and it comes with a large miniature of a brand new lion, the main starting enemy in every Kingdom Death game is a white lion and this is like the biggest big daddy before you become the lion god of that. So it is a mutated, bigger, crazier version of it. You get everything on a sprue so if you have not played Kingdom Death before then you have to assemble it and that's why I have the clippers, I have the scalpel, I have the Tamiya Thin Cement and all the stuff that comes in the box. So the first thing you'll see here is a gear grid. Don't chop these up. That's not what they're for. This is a vignette. So you are going to be given specific characters with specific loadouts, as you can see there. And that's what you're going to use. After you beat the Giga Lion, you're going to get that strain card there in black, which will allow you to hunt it later on. But you first have to play through the story. The story is in that little brochure there that I'm picking up and uh, it'll tell you everything that you need as far as how to set it up and go from and do all the fun stuff. You do need to buy Kingdom Death to go along with it for all the tokens, dice, and terrain board and all that other kind of stuff. If you had to, maybe you could print and play something uh, in order to play this uh, just with the things that are in the, the box here, but you're supposed to play it with everything. Now you also get a new location that you can build afterwards and it'll give you some premium uh, weapons and armor and that type of thing. That is the Giga Katarium and there's all this extra gear that you can get specifically from hunting more of these Giga Lions. So that part's pretty cool. I'm going to lay out all the stuff here. You do not get the card sleeves in the box. I put that on myself so keep that part in mind. And uh, once you do the strain stuff, as I was talking about there, you get to keep it in all of your different campaigns. And uh, this is just me showing off everything. There are the um, cards, as you can see there on the bottom left, that tell you about the survivors. The survivors are kind of mixed in through uh, all of the different sprues. So um, there's like an A, B, C, and D. You cut out the sections like I'll do in a little bit, and that'll make it easier for you to find just the stuff that goes to that character. One of the best things I could tell you about Kingdom Death is always look at the sprues for the numbers and try to match A to A, B to B, that kind of thing. Sometimes it'll be an A1 and a B, uh, and an A2, and uh, that means it's two halves of something. Um, on the backs of these, these are the vignette series cards, uh, so it won't match with anything else in Kingdom Death, so you can keep them separate. There is a little bit of uh, resources that are specific to the Giga Lion, as you can see there. And uh, a couple of uh, behavior cards. I don't know why they gave two. There's a basic action and a regular card, and they seem to be identical. I couldn't find anything different between them. And some behaviors and that kind of thing. You can use these uh, special uh, gear cards later. You can build them at the uh, Giga Katarium, and you can utilize that to chop up whatever monster you want to do next. So go ahead and just clear them all out. You went, oh, that's so cool. I got all my cool stuff. Throw it back in the box because um, you're not going to need it after this point, but you will need it afterwards. Uh, I normally build specialized boxes, but because of those extra gear cards, I think I'm going to have to keep this box. It's not bad looking. Uh, I did have to do some thinking as to how I was going to paint this guy up. Because if you look, there's a black and a uh, yellow one on there, but it says specifically white Giga Lion. So I'm like, all right then that kind of dictates what I'm going to do. Now, the way that I put everything together is not a um, guide in any way to say that that's how you should do it. It's just saying that's how I did it. I'm going to do things that uh, you're not going to want to do. 
I poked myself in the hand at one point. You shouldn't do. And, uh, you know, other little stupid things that people have. Now, there is a lot of um, ideas. Individuals have their own ways of cutting things off of sprues. Uh, sometimes you use the shears, sometimes you use the knife, sometimes you twist them off, you do whatever you're going to do. I'm going to be priming these and painting them, so I don't really care if there's any discoloration from doing the twists. Uh, I just kind of snap it as much as I can and then clear off whatever little excess I can to be as nice and flush as possible. Looking for mold lines. The whole time, look for mold lines. If you can scrape them off now, you'll save yourself a lot of hassle. Um, that I might have missed some in the end product. I'm not really sure if they were veins or whatever. Uh, one of the things that becomes apparent as you prime and do a zenithal prime like I'm going to do, sometimes you miss some stuff, sometimes you have to go back and reprime. If you do it like I do with an airbrush or something else that gets the coat very thin, it's not that big a deal. You don't have too much extra glooping on there. Um, but if you're going to do it with a brush, then uh, it can accumulate a lot more than when it's aerosolized so take all the little pieces off if uh, you know that's what you're gonna do and try to match them up looking at the anatomy the box means nothing in Kingdom Death it, it's not gonna tell you what goes to what or anything else like that there's no real guides outside of Vibrant Lantern um, that'll tell you what things are supposed to look like and Vibrant Lantern is a great resource if you are trying to put your own Kingdom stuff, Death stuff together. Then uh, use it. That part's great. But at a certain point, they stopped updating. And um, other users have tried to keep up with it. And the, uh, the folks at Kingdom Death themselves have tried to keep up with it a little bit. But really, go by anatomy. Um, I knew there was going to be a rock that the thing was sitting on because it's the same circular size as the base and then try to figure out going my way up and figuring out biggest chunks of the body and where they would line up um, all the way up through to the top. I knew that at a certain point there would be things on the bottom. Kingdom Death tries to cover every little bit they can with something cool um, but you're not always going to know what those things are, what they go to. If you see a smooth side, try to match it to something and see if that works. This one, when I tried to do it, just happened to be the right, right the same size to be one of the giant faces, and it uh, lined up. It seems to be the second half of the head. And you see me, you know, still cutting off mold lines and uh, little bits from the sprue and all that kind of thing. And I'm just going to keep going. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to speed it up because this process took quite a while of me figuring out what was going on and uh, yeah let's get it into warp speed alright so keep going and uh, you know clear off the little pieces take your scalpel whatever it is that you've got and uh, fit it up the, the Tamiya uh, extra thin cement is what I prefer to use to put all this stuff together I found the super glue was a little gloopy and this gets a much better bond more like a weld and you can pick whatever it is that you like the best. If you want to test the uh, adhesion on any particular piece, then cut off some sprue and glue it together and test it that way before messing with any of your models. Every little tiny bit uh, needs a little bit of work. You want to get it done as quickly as you can uh, before you do any priming. Get as much as you can just because... Um, you're going to be trying to also seal some gaps and all that kind of thing. If you notice, I have a piece of uh, masking tape on my hand it is because I ran out of band-aids. And, you know, to hell with it. Just stick some masking tape on and keep going. Uh, that's my philosophy. Uh, you want to put around all the edges, both halves if you can. And uh, it will start to weld the pieces and you'll get a really strong bond. If you have actually messed up and if you have the lonely tree... Uh, uh, expansion there is a point where you think you're going the right way and then there was this one branch it needed to be put on in a certain way that didn't make any kind of sense and you have to undo everything and put it back together it's gonna happen for a lot of people you can use the cement to unweld the weld that you already made keep in mind also if you're just slapping it on uh, in areas that you have recently welded together it will also come apart, which is going to happen a couple times when I get to doing the actual figures. 
give it maybe a couple hours before you start messing with anything if you can I was kind of in a rush when I made this video uh, to get everything in because it takes so much time to do and uh, I wanted to have it out within a reasonable amount of time like I said there's gonna be two parts to this one where everything uh, on the lion itself gets painted and then another where we actually fight the lion so uh, that being the case um, I didn't want to spend a bajillion years of time doing it the lion is going to be resting his little face and paws and body on this big old rock and uh, you have to ask yourself do I want to glue it all down is it going to be easier to glue down and then paint um, is there a lot of area underneath that I don't want paint to be there so that it will um, weld properly so that there's no little bits of paint underneath it <laughs> so that it uh, messes up your welds uh, that's a couple of things you want to consider on this one I was more worried about the real positioning and where the legs would fit if I were to just create the lion itself and then try to fit the lion onto the base so what I actually ended up doing as you'll see I put the legs onto the base first and then hooked it to the lion because um, that seemed to be a way to hold it there if you look in the center of the screen there is the lion's left foot which will be underneath it and um, it, for positioning sake that seemed to be the thing that made the most sense there is a lot exposed it doesn't look like there's too much in the model that uh, won't be accessible to a brush just a little tiny bit and that will be covered by shadow so uh, I feel pretty good about having uh, completed the whole model altogether faces are a little tricky um, you want to make sure that the the face will line up uh, a lot of times bottom jaws top jaws are separate teeth separate all that kind of thing like I'm uh, putting in here and uh, it can be part of another uh, piece like the bottom jaw of the lion is actually connected to the base and to a figure that is caught in the lion's mouth and the top line or the top jaw and face are separated out uh, you can get a lot of gaps when uh, the mane is uh, separate like this one is uh, but we'll address the gaps in a little bit everything seems to go together pretty securely pretty well uh, here I am trying to get a lot of goop on the feet so that it weakens the plastic so that it can create the bond that is the weld and I wanted to maintain as much pressure on that in the early stage as possible so that's why I stuck clothes pins on it and I had a little hard time it was a little bit of flexion so uh, what are you gonna do well let's fill some gaps while I'm waiting and I have to hold this thing so uh, I popped out my uh, Vallejo plastic putty some people like using Milliput or something else I don't care what you use uh, just go ahead and fill it in this does shrink and that's okay uh, you can shrink, let it dry, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever, and then you can go in with a file and file it back down to smooth. And uh, you may have to fill it in more than once, but uh, it just depends on the size of the gap, just keeping in mind. As I said, it does shrink. Some people say that Milliput does not shrink, but it's more uh, like a two pound or two um, compound uh, process as opposed to just gooping it in there and then filing it back down. Here I am taking apart the different sprues for the figures. And there was an A, B, C, and D. And that's for each of the figurines uh, and miniatures that go along with it for the various characters. Um, I like to start um, putting the bodies together first and then try to figure out how uh, the other pieces go in. Sometimes there's a a back piece separate or a skirt or something like that and it's easier for me to try to put all that stuff together in in the first place then go to legs and uh, maybe arms maybe head depends on the order from there so they're little tiny bits just do your best you can I got a big old meat hooks to uh, to try to be delicate with um, I do end up chopping up my thumbs <laughs> doing it this way so you do it however you think it's going to work for you and uh, you know try to be careful I guess as best you can uh, I just sit there and scrape away and cut stuff up and 
whatever I got to do. Um, I tend not to care about getting poked by knives. Whoa, that was a paint thing that just fell out on top of me. Still don't care. Still going to record the voiceovers. That's just how I am. So we're getting pretty close here. Uh, getting one down. This one, I think, I'm trying to see which one I did first. This one have a shield. One of them has a mace that's like got a head on it. One of them has a whip. The other one has a big old axe and shield. And the final one has a ram's horn and a katar, I believe. So they're going to have different styles. Katars are high luck and um, you have to get close range for it. Axes and shields. Shield obviously is good for tanks because you can block a hit. No matter what the damage is, you can just block it out and that part is good. Also, it has one of the strongest... Um, shield Mastery is one of the strongest weapon masteries you can get. Um, along with uh, Fist and Claw or Fist and Tooth. As those help you when uh, you get hit by the monster and knocked down. It prevents a lot of big problems and uh, is almost overpowered. But it's absolutely necessary for any um, campaign you're going to run. Clubs are good, especially against the Screaming Lion, and whips are great at messing with uh, priority. So, This guy is the one that has the backpack on, and one of the hands, it looks like it has a tuning fork in it. Those are the straps for the backpack. He's pulling the straps tight and um, making his way up a rock. And uh, that's kind of hard to see when you just look at the hands. It's incredibly hard to see if you're looking at the video here and we keep moving on to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy uh, pulling everything off the sprues this is the guy with the axe and the shield um, the axe kind of tilts back uh, as he's you know winding up to have a big strike uh, and that puts a lot of stress on the hand since the hand is attached and there's little itty bitty wrists <laughs> to uh, try to weld together I did not give enough time when it came to the paint stuff. I would hope that you do a better job of um, waiting and being a little more patient than I was. Eventually I got to a point where I could stick them all on there and uh, wait it out for about a week and um, that's where I'm at now is a week later and uh, they're all pretty strong. I don't think they're going to fall off or anything like that but you just gotta wait. It is a chemical process and the um, Tamiya uh, Thin Cement, once it permeates, it has to evaporate. So it's a thing and it's gonna happen. Comes down to a lot of fiddling, a lot of holding, a lot of hoping. <laughs> is this gonna work? Is this gonna stick? I don't know. Um, as you can see, I there aren't bases special for each one there's only one that first one that i did that has like a rock that uh, it's posed on the rest you can kind of set up however you like if you want to use one of the plane of faces um ones the stone inserts those are coming for me they're coming on thursday of the week that i'm doing this it's part of wave 3.1 for everybody that got in on the 2017 back kickstarter and it's march of 2021 now so it's been four years and uh, that's a lot of waiting um, especially, you know, with everything else that's going on. Uh, Adam Poots is not known for getting things done quickly, but he is known for getting things done pretty well. It's a fun game and uh, often is worth the time. And that's why Giga Lions and other stuff like this come out in between in order to keep you uh, going and finding new and interesting things to do and fixing problems with the game, such as, I'm tired of fighting the lion. Well, here's your Giga Lion, right? That's uh, the stuff it can be. This is the guy with the horn, so uh, musical instruments are a big factor in settlements. Uh, drums and rhythm chaser and all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I got a phone call, or I was switching podcasts right there. Have a podcast going. Have something going. Uh, listen to somebody do something really cool. There are um, Beasts of War, the Hit Points Gaming folks. They have uh, campaigns going all the time. Uh, Beast of War did not finish their campaign. Hit Points Gaming, Corey, 
uh, is a guy who uh, got his friend uh, Chris, he calls Snots, to play a cam cam campaign with him. Blah, 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 blah. I can talk. It's a lot that's of talking to do. I did two episodes earlier, so uh, uh, I'm a little talked out, but I'm going to get through this. And uh, what Chris did, or what Chris gets upset whenever anyone dies, and uh, Corey doesn't care. He's going to follow the rules. And that is what makes that relationship great. And then the same thing happens when uh, Corey's wife, Andrea, steps in and plays through a campaign. She loses her mind. They need to learn to not name the survivors. It's like you don't name a chicken if you're going to eat it because then it becomes a pet, right? And that's what these survivors are, is basically pets. So um, don't name them anything special to you or you're going to feel it every time one gets killed. And they're going to die suddenly all of the time. But that's part of the, the great part of watching certain people play is um they they get so upset and it's funny um and it's just kingdom death there you go see i just picked up the cards for reference and um sometimes you got to look and see what it is that they do i wasn't really sure about the angle of the whip and how to put it all or where the hair would go um the hair on this particular character is this weird anime style giant uh, pigtails um, that no human person could possibly have that much hair because the puff of hair is larger than her skull <laughs> so to have it split and still be like 15 times the volume of her head just doesn't make any sense uh, and how would that flow and how heavy would that be um, the way that it's set up is maybe she's twisting and it's in a weird flow I've had some issues with Kingdom Death models in the past and gravity, so same kind of thing happened there. Uh, there I am just trying to fix the last little bits with the whip. Uh, be very careful when you're taking off the uh, excess that was connected to the sprue. It is a, all of the whips and a lot of other pieces of Kingdom Death stuff are uh, pretty difficult to figure out. So last thing to do pop out the uh, bases, clean them up. You can make a decision whether or not you want to uh, paint your stuff while it's on, um, I don't know, a pin or something. That part's up to you, or you can put it on a base like I did and just see what happens. I would still say you probably would be best off um, giving it a day or two to dry. I did not do that, and you're gonna see those complications happen right here. This is my painting booth. And as you can see, the lion's there in the center. Um, I have a badger, a couple of badger airbrushes and a California air tool compressor. And um, I bought this just regular um, cheap as could be, uh, no brand uh, booth. It's pretty small, but it, it works for what I need to, it to work for. Um, and I just set it on a table. It's got a vacuum fan out the back. It's kind of loud. It's got some LED lights, as you can see there. And uh, that just lets me paint in my room without too much difficulty. I still wear a respirator. That's the level of safety I will not skimp on. And uh, I'll tell you, don't get it in your lungs. Uh, it doesn't get out of your lungs. There's no digestive tissue in your lungs. So don't get anything in there that you can't get out because you won't be able to get it out. That's how it works. Um, spray as best you can. Get a nice even coverage uh, on whatever your initial color is. You should be going from dark to light because that's how your eyes see. And it's going to allow you to see a lot more stuff. So just keep spraying, 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 turning, 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 and then uh, let it dry a little bit. You can hold down the air of the airbrush without the paint, and then it, it will help you dry the uh, piece that you just looked at. You'll see the gloss is starting to go away. Well, I'm adjusting the camera or whatever I'm doing there. But you will see the gloss start to go away. It will start to turn matte a little more because it is drying and that's the technique that I'm doing you spray on as much as you can dry it spray on dry it dry it. and then flip it up try to get every little nook and cranny painted um, 
the bottom obviously I'm not going to worry about because I need that that bottom to adhere as best I can to uh, the second uh, base plate that has um, the I Heart Adam Poots uh, logo on it and all that kind of stuff and or I Heart Poots is what it says and that's what a lot of the bigger pieces say um, that part's cool um, just keep going as much as you can you don't have to do a lot of coats you don't have to do more for the sake of more that's not really the point of priming in this way I'm going to be doing other colors so I'm going to be moving up into a gray and um, maybe even a white later uh, or just a higher uh, value of gray um, so it, just get it in there use it for the color get it to stick to the model and the main reason why you have the primer is so that there is an even surface you hide all the stuff the flaws and all the things that you use to fill in the gaps and um, it allows paint to stick to the model otherwise you're going to have uneven coverage the paint's going to act weird you know you do whatever you got to do hit every little nook and cranny like i said the hair was a little bit of a challenge this is just me trying to show you guys normally i'd be picking it up and spinning it around in my hand tilting it around and that, all that kind of stuff um, just to make sure I got all the bottom bits. If you were going to be putting this on a pin and priming it yourself then go with whatever those folks do. This is how I did it. Let's speed it up and I'm going to prime everything. And see twisty turny don't get upset. You can wear gloves if you want. I reuse the gloves because I don't care if uh, I, I just don't see the need of constantly throwing them away, especially after we've been on this 2020 stuff and you're like, man, I need gloves. I need this. I can't get PPE like all that, you know, I, I use the same one over and over again. Um, the air may cause if you don't wait long enough, the um, body parts to fall off. And that will happen here <laughs> a bunch of different times. Uh, I just go with it. So uh, I put them back on and went and added it later. Came back in again, reprimed again, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things that's going to happen very likely is you will see you did a bad job on the seams, or you did a bad job on uh, the way that certain uh, pieces go together, or the paint has shown some um, some flashing or uh, some mold lines or whatever you want to call it it's going to reveal everything once you go up to gray and that's okay that's you know just something that's going to happen um go back in scrape it down do whatever it is that you need to do the paint should be a very thin layer especially in the beginning because of this and you'll go in with your files you'll go in with your your knife you'll scrape things down do whatever you got to do and then hit it with the black again hit it with the gray again you won't notice it so uh, you will notice if you didn't go back through and uh, smooth things out. So that would be a main problem. So you see me spinning stuff around and like, why did he just do it to gray? It comes back up. The gray is going to tone down in color as um, the uh, as it dries. It's going to look a lot brighter right now. And then it's going to uh, tone down and it'll actually mix a little with the black. And it'll be much darker than you think it would be. Um, there's also very bright light <laughs> being uh, put on from the LEDs in the paint booth. It is not as bright with regular light as you would expect it to be. So just go back in. I'm doing what's called a Zenithal Prime, which means I'm going at about a 30 degree angle um, and checking it from there. Uh, and then I move you know, it out of the way and start priming the little other guys. And uh, some parts might fall off. Don't care. I'll go back in, paint it. Uh, I'll go back in, glue it, paint it, and everything else I need to do. Uh, you can't really see from here. Maybe you can if you got really sharp eyes, but um, there is a little bit on the tail that you can still see, and uh, I was upset by it, and I did end up going back through with a round file and uh, adding some stuff. Oh, so where does this come from? That's not Kingdom Death. Here's the deal. Always have something that you've been meaning or forgot to paint ready so that you can use up whatever primer that you still have left when you're done. So I had that ballista from Zombicide Green Horde left over 
and there we go. A week later, still using LED lights, uh, setting up my, my little painting area, as you can see. And uh, this is on a different part. This is my desk, which is on the opposite side of uh, where I was sitting in order to do the priming. And, you know, whatever your space is, mine's an ugly old 10, 15 year old Microsoft keyboard <laughs> and a piece of wood on a desk from Ikea. Yours is whatever you want it to be. Here I am using contrast paints. So uh, why didn't I use a fancy airbrush on all the different pieces and all the other stuff? Um, you, I will like the yellow color as an ink. And that's one of the things I think that contrast paint is best utilized for is uh, in place of ink. Uh, you might not be able to find inks everywhere, but all the game stores seem to have full lines and colors and everything like that of these contrast paints. Uh, when you shake them up and all that type of stuff, then uh, they mix together. But if they are separated, then uh, you will have all the chunky stuff on the bottom and the ink will rise to the top. You can utilize that information however you like. What I am doing here is making sure to spread as much of the wet contrast paint around so that it doesn't get um, the effect that you would normally get where it stacks up and uh, acts as a, a wash into the little cracks and areas. I don't want that. I want it to be nice and even and have as much of that yellow coat as possible and as thin as possible so that the xenothal part of it shines through. You can see just there with your eyes because of the xenothal priming, even though it's fairly light, uh, that details and contrasts are much, much, much better. It's just how your eyes are designed. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to continue to use this, uh, this, uh, contrast paint yellow it is uh did i show it to you i showed it to the camera but uh a and then uh yellow uh i use it for a couple things i didn't like it on batman uh when i used that for for that uh it wasn't a bright enough yellow but i do like it here as a base coat so it's more of a more of an ugly sickly yellow than the high yellow that i was going to use for signal or uh different parts of like black canary's hair or anything like that so uh, I didn't want to use it for the hair here because I didn't have as much control. Uh, I wanted to do something else with the mane um, instead of that. You can do it however you like. Just get in there. Try not to slop it around too much. I have a very short brush that uh, doesn't allow uh, too much uh, spray. Like the, the bristles, as they touch things, they can actually spray. And um, a shorter brush is going to do that less than a longer brush. So let's speed this up and uh, see what the coverage is like after I get the whole body done. All right, warp speed. So yeah, just getting in there. Like I said, it's burning it around. It gets almost dry after I've uh, sat there and scrubbed it all down as much as possible. You can see that even with um, me doing that, that there is a little bit of that orange peeking through um settling in various parts that's okay it's going to give your character or it's going to give your model character this is a vicious beast this is not some uh salon <laughs> critter <laughs> that uh, is a poodle or anything like that so it will likely have a coat that changes and ripples based on its musculature um i don't know necessarily why it's even a white lion i figure an animal like this uh would want to camouflage in the darkness of kingdom death so it would go black, but that's not the case. It seems to be so dark that they don't care. Maybe they have to be white so that they can see each other for mating purposes. Who knows? Um, Adam Poots knows. The rest of us don't. Um, it's just a matter of imagination and all that kind of cool stuff. So get the rump, get the testes, get the tail, get all the different pieces as best you can and then start working your way around to the face and um, don't do the whole face like stay out of the eyes uh, stay out of the mouth and make a decision on your nose if you want it to have a little kitty cat nose or if you want it to be the same color uh, also it does have ears in all of that so uh, do like I did and search them out figure out which one's hair which one's ears and uh, base coat that as well so that you can get it in a second. 
yeah so here's the slowdown part and just do whatever you can to be a little on the delicate side if there is a little bit of um, it's not overspray but overbrush whatever you want to call it painting in the wrong spot or droplets or anything like that it's not the end of the world because you are going to be painting just about every other part of this um, model so don't worry too much about it the main thing is thinking about your colors and um, what you want it to be for yourself so you don't have to follow through on anything I'm doing I'm going to use a wide variety of paints it's not just the contrast paints I'm using Army Painter, uh, Citadel, and uh, P3 for most of the stuff. Vallejo on the primers. Uh, so whatever's there, that's what I use. And I got a big box of Fantasy Flight <laughs> card sleeves that is just filled with browns of various colors and flesh tones. And that sits on my desk all the time because I'm always reaching for those. So why not just plop them all out there? make life a little more easy speaking of which i gotta put morn fang brown i put it on the wrong shelf that one i end up sticking with the reds i just noticed that while i'm doing this okay now that's put away all right now um yeah go in it's going to be a little difficult to get to all the little spots uh but you will see them as you twist and turn the model around and it's not going to get all of the higher colors that I'm going to put later. So having you get all of that dark uh, spot of the coat, uh, even onto the bottom, is going to be kind of important. So here I am looking for some more colors. Uh, I'd been staring at the teeth for quite a while, so I wanted to get those done. So that's what this mammoth bone is going to be, uh, is from P3, Menoth White Base. Sorry, is the name of that one. And that's what I'm going to use on the teeth. And the Hammerfall Khaki. Is that what that one is? Yeah, Hammerfall Khaki. I end up using the Hammerfall Khaki for a lot of different things. And also that, uh, what do I think it's a Cadian Flesh Tone? Yeah, Cadian Flesh Tone from um, Citadel. So clean up my brush a little bit. I get the smaller one out. Um, the Cadian Flesh Tone is going to be on his cute little nose. So that's what I'm going to do here and give him a little kitty cat nose. Um, yeah. You know, make him cute. Why not? Just because he's a terrifying killing machine doesn't mean he can't have a cute little, little nose there. Um, I paint out of the pots a lot. Do or don't do that. I don't care. <laughs> Some everyone knows that they're gonna do it differently, and then they're gonna tell you, "Oh, don't do it!" Like blah blah blah. You're gonna dry out your paints and this, that, and the other thing. If you're gonna use a lot of it, fine. You're either gonna dry out the paints, or you're gonna waste a bunch of it because you're plopping out so much of it just to do a little tiny thing. With the inks and the contrast paints, um, I end up spilling those things way more often <laughs> than uh, I uh, than I would otherwise, and I never know how much to use, so I don't worry about it. That is a pink that I use for the inside of mouths that is Emperor's Children Layer from Citadel and I'm gonna go through and do the gum line with that uh, I know that the mouth is chewing down on a body so there is going to be a lot of um, liquid pouring out so I don't need to be too precious about it I want it to have more of a wet look at the end but I do think that the um, lips would peel back away from the teeth for this so you should be able to see some of the gum line and uh, to me that part was important um, both top and bottom getting that little bit and feeling like that is the basic colors of the anatomy of this lion so just a little bit on the bottoms making it look nice and pink and pretty it's going to mellow out so I know it's a it's a pretty high pink but it's going to mellow out and uh, it won't be as noticeable or bad as you might think and then that Menmoth Menoth white base 
uh, is going to be used for the teeth. Never mind my clicking around to watch another video <laughs> while I'm painting. Which is another reason why I'm doing this voiceover instead of doing it live. is because it was way more comfortable to do it that way. He's got a, a real bad dentist. He's got teeth that kind of poke, uh, poke out like sharks. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're all over the place. They're in rows like a shark, not like a lion. So he is a little bit of um, an ugly, an ugly lion in that respect. But a beautiful model, right? He just needed some love, someone to scratch his ears, or whatever. He wouldn't be such a monster. Who's to say? Who would know? Adam Poots would know. That's the only person. So anyway, just giving it a little bit of that teeth love. So let's speed it up a little bit, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, the next coat and the next color. This is where I broke out the uh, Hammerfall khaki is going to come up after this. And the reason for that is I want it to be a nice thin coat, not quite a white, not quite a yellow. And that khaki seems to fall between a light gray and a yellow. And that will also allow the yellow underneath in the skin to shine through pretty well. So I get it nice and wet and the same kind of uh, deal where I was spreading the color. Um, it was thin and I would spread it and thin and I would spread it. Uh, I'm doing the same thing over top and that's going to get it closer to the look of a white lion instead of a yellow lion. And um, you're just trying to get starting on like a wide stroke of a large muscle and spreading it out from there. So if you're going to have the most amount of pigment, the most amount of paint on a particular part uh, is going to be when you first um, make contact from your pot to the model. So uh, do it in a place where you're going to want the, the brightest color and spread it out from there. And then it'll look a little better than if you're trying to chase it a different way. So as you can see, um, I'm putting the tops pretty gingerly of the feet and that kind of thing because that's where it's going to catch the most light and be the brightest. And then otherwise I'm uh, putting it on a muscle and then spreading it after the muscle onto another surface. And uh, less pigment for things that go underneath because I kind of want the effect that it creates of um, seeming like a shadow. And that'll help me do it. Uh, blow on it, do whatever you got to do in order to keep it dry. Uh, if you have a very thin coat like this, it'll also dry faster as you spin the model. Going round and round and round, getting all the different stuff. And you can see, like, the muscles are popping. The, the, between the left and the right, um, you know, the, the light is catching the, the various muscles better when I've painted across it. And you can see it, it coming up higher even though it's still wet uh, and you're gonna have a certain level of shine from the, um, the lights just because it's wet. But get in there, all the uncomfortable places, you don't wanna to touch a lion <laughs> and put paint on them. Uh, do your best that way. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a broken ankle. I did what I could and I was satisfied, but yeah, it's, it's a little imperfect, but I don't think it's the end of the world on it on his back right leg um, for whatever reason it just didn't mold up uh, or, or weld up the way I wanted it to but eh, it's good enough I'm not really heartbroken about it but I will admit that there are parts that I just stopped carrying and you could sit there and mess with yourself if you wanted to so yeah more just bringing up them highlights working it through working it through And as it dries, it's going to mellow down. It seems brighter than it than it is right now. Um, but yeah, it's going to take on that that khaki color. Look like your pants. And I wanted there to be some difference between the the white lion and the giga lion, but at least you could see that they're basically the same species. 
so that's why I'm not doing just white which is what my white line, regular prologue line and all that is fairly white and this one is more yellow. Um, this is like a mutated version of that species. And one of the things I've done uh, with the P3 caps, I accidentally tear it off the tops all the time. But I kind of like uh, shaking the, the bottle and then flipping the cap on the top and then it's almost like the cap's on it. But I still have myself a little personal well in order to uh, pull pigment off of. So, I don't know. Works well for me. You do whatever you want. I'm not your boss. Alright, so that's how it looks. And, yep, jumping over to the next thing. Okay, so right here you can see what my White Lion custom box looks like. They're all black. They're sealed up. Um, they're easy for me to find. I just pop the lion out and then I can compare colors. As I said, I wanted it to be kind of in the same world. So I took a look and saw what the mane was on my previous one. And he's basically an albino. <laughs> so um, I don't necessarily want to go in that direction. But I do want to keep it light and... Uh, looking like that. Look how pretty that back is with the yellow kind of poking through a little bit and the khaki on top and everything like that. It looks like a monster. So that is the messy desert from Citadel and that's what I'm going to do the main with and it's going to be a more of an ochre color as you can see and that's what I'm going to use as the base of the main. It's going to be ochre and then I'm going to dry brush on top and that will go more to the khaki. So it looks like it's still the same fur, it's just thicker. And we have that under color of the yellow, so it'll be with the thicker hair, there'll be more of it underneath. Uh, it'll be kind of randomly distributed and um, it'll allow the curls to show through and all that kind of stuff. So that part I like. Uh, it was a little thick when I popped it out. If you do like I do, and you paint out of the pot all the time, it's going to dry up. So that's just something you're going to have to deal with. I take a little uh, piece of uh, sculpting tool and I stir it as much as I can. And then I throw in uh, not Lamia medium, but flow improver from Vallejo is the medium that I'm going to end up tossing in there. In order to, um, yeah, so you can see it there, in order to to revive my paints that have lost moisture from me leaving the caps up. You can always put the cap down, you can put it into a, a palette, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, I just happen to do it this way. And since I have that habit, there's a couple things that I've um, accumulated over the years to unscrew myself uh, from those things. One of them is this Robart paint shanker, and it shakes my paint. So yeah works great you'll find out you have colors that are totally different than what you thought they were before because you were shaking it by hand and especially metallics and other stuff like it's just it's, these things are amazing they're a little noisy but uh, I enjoy having it quite a bit but that's pretty simple I'm gonna take that Zemisi Desert and I'm gonna slap it on that paint or all that paint onto that model and uh, we can speed it up all right now we're cooking with gas so <laughs> pop that thing out, get that line going, okay? I wanted to start with the face. You can start however you want. And all right, so I managed to pull it off. You can kind of see what I'm doing. <laughs> there you go. Good work, Joe. Now you can see what, what is actually happening here. It's going to be a little wet. Um, that's okay. Just follow it around. Um, try to get in the cracks because this is your, your shadow color. Um, don't worry so much about the highs, just try to get it down in there wherever you need to get it. Try not to over go back over your previous work. Yeah, and I had to go back to work real quick and then come back and <laughs> then I could finish it up a little bit. So um, The tail had a little bit, so I wanted that to be the same color as the mane. Sometimes they're darker. You can look at reference for lions if that's what you want to do. I'm not going to stop you. Yeah, just get it in there. And uh, then afterwards, let it dry as much as you can. And um, 
then you'll end up doing your dry brushing over top of that. And for the dry brush on this one, I ended up using Tyrant Skull Dry from Citadel. And mine was a little too dry, so I wetted it down a little bit. And I used a very thick brush, a big shade brush, the large, from Citadel. Um, you can get whatever you want. Uh, Tabletop Minions advocates using very cheap makeup brushes. I wish I had a bunch. Um, because I would use that instead because they're cheaper and go from there. But I already had purchased this Citadel one and um, that's what I tend to use it for is the larger areas of dry brushing. And um, to try to unify the colors, what I ended up doing is uh, in addition to uh, the main, just hitting the highs on a couple of more spots of muscles with that same dry brush um, color, you, it just helps uh, carry the effect of it being the same hair over between the um, the mane and the rest of the coat. So you can see me sitting there messing with it, and it just wasn't working. Um, you can see me get it a little bit higher between the one hand I was working on and the other hand. Um, it gets a little bit brighter. And trying to mess with the muscles and all that. Seeing how far I'm going to go. Uh, I wish I had uh, a little fresher, because they, get, they end up spongier when they're fresher of those dry ones from Citadel. And it's a little easier to use, but I put a little water in it, made it work. So, yeah. Thin as you can get on the muscle parts and a little bit thicker as you can see the way that the dry brush is working on uh, the main. You go against the grain because you just want the edges and there you go. This is almost real time. I didn't have a whole lot of time so I didn't wait for it to dry. You can do that if you want though. So yeah, just kind of get it everywhere. And uh, as it was drying, I figured, you know, what the hell, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just paint the whole thing up and get it done and over with. So cleared out my brushes and went to work with this green for the acanthus. There are two acanthus that are growing out of there. I made a decision with the sculpts. I saw some things and these weird bits that look like, are they rocks? Like, what are they? They look like little body parts, maybe they were breasts, maybe they were poop. And that's what I figured that they were, was poop. And it would be a very um, fertile area around the lion because it didn't care what it was eating and where it was killing stuff. There is a section underneath that ledge of the face where it's been storing trophies. and. Um, it's just been pooping all over the place. And that gives fertilizer for these uh, acanthus plants, making them a vibrant green. I s continue to use, this one was a Warp Lightning from Contrast. And again, using it as an ink. And then I'm gonna go back through and uh, add some other greens from P3 and some Citadel ones. Afterwards, uh, there are a lot of body parts that are not popping, just as you sit there and look at them. So here I am giving this one is Cardic Flesh from P3 as the base coat. Um, it's going to be very red because it's supposed to be like covered in viscera. It's been chopped off, torn off, whatever the case is, off of survivors. And they're generally naked. So uh, I decided to just give it as dark a flesh tone that was as red as possible. And then I was going to throw Mornfang Brown and um, Flesh Wash or Red Tone from the Quick Shade line from Army Painter over top to make it look like it was just drying blood was all over the place. Uh, here I popped out the uh, Black Templar uh, contrast paint and it was uh, some delicate work of giving him a manicure <laughs> and a pedicure so it was a little bit off, off camera for me to be able to see what was going on. 
And there's also a beetle there next to the acanthus plant, so I hit that with the black. Um, if you get a little bit too much black and it ends up in the toes instead of on the claws where it's supposed to be, throw some blood on it, you'll be fine. He's sitting there in his own, um, you know, not in his own poop, but around his own poop. So, you, you can throw blood on it. <laughs> It'll get you out of there real, real fast. Um, I switched over to um, a different green. This is another P3 green. This one is, oh, what is it called? This one is called Trader Green. And it's more of a drab, and I like it a lot. I use it in a lot of applications. Um, and then over top of that, I think I used, which one's this? Uh, Skarsnik Green from Citadel. On top of that, just going from a darker to lighter to very light green. And you know, depending on the angle of the light, depending on how you look at it, it may look darker, so that's why I do it that way go from there and yeah I even did all the little faces underneath uh, and then I'm gonna hit it with the Mornfang Brown which is my go-to dried blood color so all the little bits that were torn off um, randomly hitting spots in the mane that are underneath him like the beard area where it would have dripped spots on the teeth all that kind of stuff inside that little cove where he just tucked all of his trophies um, on the rib cages and bones and other stuff like that. Uh, I also hit it with that Mornfang Brown a little bit, splotchy, throwing it everywhere. Just you don't know how it dried or where it dried or when it dried. So uh, don't be perfect with it. Just kind of be a little on the random side. But go with gravity in that ter uh, sense. Turbo Dork! Um, the Beetle, I wanted to have some uh, interference kind of coat going on. And I used Turbo Dork for that, and the one I used was Bolton Mantle. And it will have a nice little purple shine whenever you turn it that people can see. Um, I did that with my Flower Knights and Dung Beetle Knights and all this stuff using uh, interference paints in order to make that work. Then my go-to poop color is Contrast Wildwood. It's my favorite of the contrast colors, is this very dark brown. Never mind me having to mess with the mouse to start up another video or whatever. And I just think he's going to have pooped all over the, um, the ground. And it's just going to be a mix of stuff wherever he last hunted. Uh, the main thing of the stone being fairly clean. But the rest of it um, is just muck. It could be mud. It could be anything. It's hard to say though. Um... There is a uh, a weird structure to it where it doesn't look like stone, so it's got a flow that goes with a lot of it. It looks like it was deposited in piles and then kind of like slipped away, so there's that. There could also be other body parts underneath it that has been kind of buried, which offers some of the structure to it, and that's why it's all mud covered and, and used in that capacity. So I thought that the dark brown, the wildwood, would be the best representation of that and um, kind of fill out the scene. I clean up my brush, get all the uh, contrast stuff off because it's not all ink. And I use a little bit of that brush cleaner to go there. Uh, and now it's time for the uh, red tone, which is going to dry in weird ways and leave little uneven spots and that's exactly what i'm going for um you know it's this it's a weird scale so um it'll be kind of perfect putting it all over the uh the hands because they grab the body and put it into the mouth he's not a snake um also throwing it underneath uh all of the stuff in the little shelf area to just make it a little extra gory and there's also some lead be belcher lead belcher 
Um, that's the color I use for a lot of the lanterns. It's trying to be consistent. And there are some lanterns underneath the little shelf. I'm going to guess that they've gone out. There's no reason for him to be putting his stuff somewhere people can see. Um, unless he wants to see it. So you can try to color the lanterns. If you were going to color the lanterns, do that before you <laughs> um, do the assembly on everything. Before you glue everything down or else you're going to have a real hard time getting to it. And then in, I have my poop highlights. My poop highlights are going to be done with Gorthor Brown. Just hitting the tops so they pop a little bit. Contrast paint is supposed to create highlight areas and all that for you. It does an okay job of that. So it's not the greatest in the world, but it's okay. I like it with just a little bit extra paint thrown in. Um, it's got a very consistent diet. So... There's not much other than meat for a lion to eat. And then finally, just to fill in some areas where dust might be and to clean up around the acanthus plant, I uh, figure there'd be some dust accumulating underneath it. Uh, Agrax Earthshade, this is not the glossy one, it is the regular matte one. Um, you can buy them in either, either way. And I'm just going through the cracks to highlight them a little bit more and um, fulfill that look so you either like my giga lion or you don't that's up to you i'm not going to be offended if you want to do yours differently but maybe this helped you have some ideas of how mine worked out and how you maybe want to paint yours and stuff to think about and that's it thank you everybody thank you all my subscribers and everybody who has been keeping the channel going if you've come to this channel because you're interested in the Giga Line, maybe you'll check out the rest of my stuff. I have uh, a few videos of things on how to speed up the play of Kingdom Death, getting it to the table in three to five minutes as opposed to um, taking a long time to set up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, boxes to build as are like my White Lion one. I've done for every single uh, other creature that you can pick up and I find it to be much more protected than a felled her foam it doesn't break anything and um, all those different things that I've built you can see how to do it in my kingdom death playlist otherwise you can come back to my channel every week and see why I had those subscribers uh, accumulating is because I uh, go through everything I can in both tabletop gaming for board games and tabletop gaming for RPGs and let you know what's happening in the crowdsourcing spaces so you don't miss anything because I would hate it for somebody to miss out on something that they really love also talk about things that uh, may be affecting your shipments um, things that are going on in the world in uh, gaming trends that kind of stuff advice for people that have a very challenging time getting uh their kickstarter going so if you look at their page you can see like oh this is something i can definitely tell needed to be done and is why people aren't being attracted to this game and uh helping them that way with constructive criticism i try to keep it uh, as positive as possible and be constructive about it uh, and go from there if it's a scam though i'm gonna tell you flat out it's a scam first thing if, uh, forward and i don't want anyone to get uh, their money taken and so far Kickstarter has been pretty good. There's been some some terrible, terrible campaigns out there. But for the most part, it's been pretty good. So just depends on what you expect. That being said, I expect to get my, my voice some rest. And you guys have been great. So if you like, share, and subscribe, that would be perfect. Um, all of my Nemesis painting videos, I get very few subscribers, very few likes, and tens of thousands of views. I don't know what to, to, to say about that, but, uh, you know, enjoy something that a creator makes and then show them that you enjoy it by doing the like uh, button and show them maybe that you'll want to come back and see more of what they do by hitting the subscribe button. And that should be for everybody, not just me. You guys have a good one, and I'll see you when we play against the Giga Lion in the next video of this series.